Hi, I'm Lisa Savage. Welcome to Pathways to Progress. I'm here with Counselor Victoria Pelletier and virtually Counselor Roberto Rodriguez, who sadly has come down with COVID, but here he is from his sick bed, from his home, joining in to our show tonight. So thank you for making this extra effort to be here. Oh, God. Much appreciated. And thank you uh, to our tech crew for making this happen. So, gosh, let's check in. How yeah. has it been since we met last? Um, since we met last, we yeah, we had a, a really, really long meeting. I think the longest that the city's ever had. That's what we were hearing. Huh? We ended, we started the meeting at five and we ended um, probably around 1.45 in the morning. So Maybe I got- Maybe you guys could get in the Guinness Book of World Records. Well, I, that's longest. what I was thinking. I was, I think it's the longest that, one that we'd ever had. And we had four hours of public comment, of course, on mm -hmm. the order around the encampment. So that's naturally why we were there so late. We didn't even start deliberation for that item until after midnight. It was probably around 12.15. I think that we started even talking about that item. So it was definitely a really, heavy night for a lot of us. And then just like going into deliberation after four hours of public comment was uh, was an experience. I think that in two years of being on the council, we've never gone remotely that late. I think the closest that we've gotten is maybe, I don't know, 11 maybe, but yeah, it was, it was a really long night for us. And how did the public testimony break down? Were most people in favor of the resolution, the amendment, or not in favor, even split? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, I think it was somewhat split. Uh, um, perhaps there was a, a larger number of people that were speaking against the order, and that might have been based just on how, how you know, how effective fear is in activating people's emotions. You know, a lot of the messaging against Order 68 was, um, you know, it, it really just fear mongering. You know, telling people how bad the encampments are going to get if this order passes, and how People will prefer to stay outdoors over the winter if this order passes. And all these things that were really painting us to be, you know, the leaders of, you know, just reckless behavior and encouraging lawlessness. And that, I believe, really struck at the heart of a lot of residents that came out and spoke against Order 68. Um, so at the end of the day, I, I, I always say, you know, even if we'd had 670 people show up, testify, we're hearing from 1% of our population. Mm -hmm. So we always we always ask ourselves, right, when we say that we have to bring an, an equity and a justice lens into this, we always want to ask ourselves, who is not in the room? Who are we not mm -hmm. hearing from? What concerns and, 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 and points are being left out of this conversation? Mm -hmm. And if you summarize what we heard from com public comment, there was a lot that was left out. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of it that has to do with the dignity of the unhoused community that was left out. Okay. And uh, Councillor Pelletier, you were complaining a little bit about this false dichotomy that seemed to emerge between it's either shelter or it's encampments. And your yeah. problem with that is that it's illogical. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, it was frustrating how the messaging, I think, very conveniently got co-opted into if we can't get people inside, then what are we going to do? We have to get everybody inside. It's cold out. It's winter time. Um, as if people aren't dying in, in all seasons, being unhoused, obviously, regardless. Summertime, like I attend, I have the privilege of attending Homeless Voices for Justice. Um, they hold the longest day of homelessness on the summer solstice to mm -hmm. talk about how it's never a, a safe time to be without shelter, whether it is summertime, whether it's wintertime. So the, the narrative around you know, we can't leave people outside was so harmful and frustrating because even if every shelter was full, and it often is, the, the people are still outside. We'll still have hundreds of people outside. Mm -hmm. So it's not like by passing Order 68, we were saying, yeah, we're just going to leave everybody outside and, and that's it. It was, let's make sure that in the meantime of working to get people into shelter, which we are continuously actively doing. So I think people thought we weren't going to try and get people into shelter. We're just saying, let's not bulldoze their homes while we're trying to get people into shelter. We're saying, let's let everybody at least stay where they are with, of course, some carve outs of places that no camping is allowed until we can at least work towards getting everybody to move into the shelter. But by bulldozing the homes and saying, if you don't want to take the shelter, then we're getting rid of your home, then we are crim we are criminalizing homelessness. And I don't know any other way to say it, because we're essentially saying, 
if you don't take this shelter, which again has a significant amount of barriers, which is feedback that we've gotten directly from the unhoused community of the fact that you can't bring in a pet, you can't bring in a backpack, you can't stay with your significant other. These are significant problems that I would hope we would be working to alleviate so that people didn't feel like they were going into a jail cell or a warehouse. And I think it comes from a really privileged perspective from us with houses saying, well, I don't know why you wouldn't want to go stay in a warehouse. I don't know anyone who would actually want to go stay into an area where you can't bring in your personal belongings or have any sense of autonomy. So it was frustrating that we're kind of saying like, it's either the warehouse that you don't like or we're bulldozing your home and there's no in between. And I think Order 68, a lot of people maybe missed that. To me, that was, that was an in-between method of saying, we're gonna look at the systemic issues, we're gonna work to get everybody into shelter, but the best and most effective way to do that is to not disperse everybody throughout the city again and again and again. Because as we know, every time a uh, an encampment swept, it becomes an emphasis area. And then people are wondering why encampments are growing and growing, why we have a Harborview encampment now that's growing, is because no one has anywhere to go. And I think my, uh, my biggest thing too was we've been sweeping since May. For even the people that are pro-sweeping, it's not working. It's just not working. So I'm like, even if you were pro-sweeping, mm -hmm. you can't look at me and say that the sweeps are working, because they're not. We continue to see encampments. We continue to see bigger encampments. We have a significant problem, and it's so frustrating that you know, the order failed six to three because I feel like people were just kind of looking at the top issue of saying, we don't want anybody outside. We want to get everybody inside. Uh, Roberto, Anna, and I very much want to get people inside as well, but we also don't want to bulldoze the only belongings that they have in the process of doing so. Sure. Um, and preserve their humanity as best as we can. And so it, it makes, frustrating. doesn't it make it harder for their caseworker or so, yeah. someone who's working with them to find housing, to literally find them again yeah. after the encampments are swept? Um, Councilor Rodriguez, you were telling me something interesting before we started about uh, how Councilor Trevorrow got a huge amount of pushback for referring to unhoused people as her consent. Constituents. Yeah, she did too. Yeah, it, you know, as I said before, like the, the dignity of unhoused people is, is, I believe, was was, you know, missing from our conversation. And and Councillor Trevorrow had, you know, she spoke very eloquently uh, about the purpose of our order. And and in it, she expressed that she she considers all these folks to be her constituents, right? Because they're members of our community, they're our neighbors. And, and she received pushback from that, uh, people saying, how dare you consider them your constituents? And, and, it, and it's, it's kind of like tied in there, like they're saying, how dare you compare them to me, right? Like I'm a taxpayer, I'm a property owner, I contribute to this community and they're not equal to me. And, and that came across so, so loudly mm -hmm. from folks that were pushing back against that comment. And, and it, it's really disheartening. It's disheartening because, you know, even, you know, we I went into that evening pretty sure that that order was going to fail, you know, but but I felt it was important for us to put it out there for counselors to, to vote and be on the record on this and, and to try to have a substantive discussion about this and, and, and our policies and the impact of our policies. And, and you know, I, I, I was hoping that we could at least clarify some of those misconceptions about where on house members of our community belong in our discussions and how we prioritize their needs. And and unfortunately, we were robbed of that. And, and, if, and if, if anything, I feel like we set up the opportunity for people to express more of this hatred and this um, dehumanizing of, you know, unhoused people. And it was it was sad. It was really sad to see. I um can I you know, I, I, I agree with Councillor um, uh, Pelletier with, with Tori that, um, you know, the, the criminalization of homelessness and, and the way that our policies have been creating problems since we started with the sweeps and the way that people that support the sweeps are just completely neglecting all the ill impacts. Everything that we heard from people of their experiences and, and all the criminal activity, everything is happening under our current policies. And there was no acknowledgement of how our current policies are worsening these situations. Everything was old. Oh, if this order passes, it'll just get that much worse. Mm. You know, one, one last thing that I want to acknowledge <clears throat> Since the order failed, there has been three, I believe, four deaths in unhoused people in our community. Mm -hmm. And most of them have been people that have been isolated, you know, people that have been pushed out into isolation and they've been found either because of a fire or some other horrible incident. And we need to acknowledge that that's happening because of our policy, mm -hmm. you know, that we created those, but we, that, those people's lives. We lost them because of our policies, and and no one should push back against that, and no one should be able to just gloss over that. 
you know, it, it's not because Order 68 was proposed. It's because of the way that we're currently conducting business and the way that this city currently treats unhoused members of our community. Yeah, it's uh, been sad. The rate of people dying has been pretty mm -hmm. uh, extreme lately. Unhoused people. So we, uh, Warren Edgar, our director, and I went out into the street and asked people for their thoughts again, as we have been doing. And the first clip actually is completely um, pertinent to what we're talking about. So maybe uh, if Warren's ready, we could run that one and then uh, we can talk about it. So do you have any reaction to the recent vote uh, that failed the attempt to ban encampment sweeps for the winter? I think it's great to be able to ban that for the winter, like putting a like time frame on it. But I still can't believe we voted in a mayor that is for sweeping camps. Like it just doesn't seem and like criminalizing homelessness in general, you know, with such an issue here and that's just not the way. Criminalizing homelessness is not going to solve the issue. It's probably gonna worsen it. So this person was expressing why did we elect a mayor that's going to continue to criminalize homelessness, but um, that was a voter. That's certainly not on you guys. That was the voters doing what they do. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me that the phrase criminalizing homelessness also encompasses more than just housing. It encompasses things like access to sanitary ways to dispose of your bodily waste, access to a place to take a shower and wash your clothes. Um, the, the sort of crim, you know, what I, what, from the outside looking in, it looks to me like Portland just goes, you're, this encampment's pushed out now, you can never camp there again. Mm -hmm. Now that you're pushed out of there, now you can never camp there again. Aren't they sort of just creating a patchwork of you can never camp there again, so eventually, any tent, any camping becomes illegal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's the policy itself is is so wild to me in that way of of the fact that we're designating emphasis areas, and then people are wondering again why we're having these large encampments that are appearing because they're, we're running out of room. I mean, Harborview is only, I'm sure, a couple of weeks away from being swept. And then I have no idea, um, you know, where individuals will go. But I, I definitely agree that it's it's not just being without a home, but it is we are just stripping these individuals of their dignity by the way that we speak about them, by the way that we treat them. I mean, we heard in public comments someone said that someone said that giving food to the unhoused community was enabling them, like giving someone a it's enabling them to what, enabling live, them. like yeah, and, okay. and I mean like giving someone a sandwich was an act of enabling the unhoused community, and that it's a very much like pick yourselves up by your bootstraps mentality, as if we don't live in a society where there's a significant amount of classism and, oppress and oppression and racism, um, and it's hard. I mean, it's it's hard to to have to deal, I guess, with the fact that the, the order failed, because that felt very much like our, our, our chance to really do something as counselors. And, you know, I think in terms of the, the new mayor, counselor, mayor, not counselor anymore, Mayor Dion that was elected, I mean, at the end of the day, the mayor still gets one vote. Um, and I think, you know, a, a lot of people definitely look at the mayor position as equivalent to the city manager, and it's not. We're still subservient to the city manager. The, ma the mayor is still, in theory, an at-large counselor. They do get to stand at the top and definitely facilitate the conversation, but we all still have one vote at the end of the day. So I think it'll be interesting to see how we move forward with our goal-setting workshop, because I know that the conversation around our unhoused community and what we're gonna do will come up, um, and especially with the work of the Health and Human Services and Public Safety Committee, that will start back up again again in January. So I'm looking forward to having conversations of saying, well, okay, Order 68 didn't pass, so what else can we do? What's, what are the options? Because as we've seen, what we've continued to do is not working. So I look forward to the other counselors who did not support this measure also to come up with some other solutions if they think that you know Order 68 maybe wasn't something that they wanted, then I'm open to a discussion around what it is that we can do instead. Oh, you don't think those 50 extra beds are gonna solve the Problem. Oh man, the 50 bed conversation will, will I'll, I'll let Councillor Rodriguez talk about that. <laughs> it's 170 beds, by the way. True. And the large majority of them right now, I believe, are sitting empty. So yeah. that yet to be determined whether that really is going to be an effective strategy. Um, you know, I, if I can just add something, I am, um, you know, the, the mayor, um, you know, Mayor Dion during his campaign, you know, he I think he struck a chord with 
with people when he the way that he spoke about this issue particularly and um and as we heard in public comment through order 68 um this this really got people activated and whether we agree with what mark said or not you know this is i believe a big reason why he was catapulted to to win the election you know he he struck a chord in the way that he spoke about homelessness and the way that he he plans to approach it i you know one of the biggest i think problems that i was trying to also highlight here is how ineffective the council is when it comes to administrative policies that the city manager can execute without our oversight and and i was trying to we i believe you know the health and human services committee who by the way after after two years of asking to be part of that committee i'm finally a member of that committee to so my third year uh, of this term i'm finally going to be in health and human services i didn't, so, know, I uh, didn't know this sorry. that's exciting yeah absolutely <laughs> we're in it for this year together so i'm really excited i've been trying to fight this, all these issues from health and human services from like the from outside so i'm good to be part of this now but um but yeah, so I, I um you know I think that he struck a chord with, with folks and and it's what catapulted him to be elected. Um, I, I, I guess what I was trying to say is you know the the administrative policies and and the council not being able to have oversight over that was part of what we were trying to communicate through Order 68 that changing our ordinance on camping is the only way that we could stop the sweep. There's no other way that the council can stop the sweep because the manager is the one that has that authority and um. You know, if my fellow counselors who agree that the sweeps are not an effective and they're an inhumane way to treat homelessness, and yet they didn't support Order 68, mm -hmm. they either fail to acknowledge that is the only vehicle that we have ac accessible to us to stop the sweeps, or they just didn't step up to the plate that night. And, but and couldn't you pass? That bluntly, but that's couldn't the way you, I felt. couldn't yeah. you pass an emergency um, uh, ordinance that would trigger emergency pay for every worker in the city to solve the? <laughs> Sorry, too soon. <laughs> this, I, I, let me well, let me let me let me add to what, why you're saying this. You, you're right, and I share this with you. And I don't know that I've I've spoken very much about this in, in public, but before Order 68, I was attempting to bring forward a moratorium on the sweeps by way of an emergency order, very similar to the way that the emergency order that added 50 beds of the to the shelter. And I have worked for a week with the city manager, with corporation council, with other counselors, and I had it all lined up to get onto the agenda. And the night before it got published onto the agenda, mm. I get notified um, to that if this order passes by the, the way that it's written, that this would enact uh, or kick in uh, hazard pay throughout the city. And and I was you know, obviously shocked to hear this because they had, this hadn't been mentioned for the entire week that I have been working to bring up this proposal. And at the very, very last minute, this gets dropped on my lap. And I'm like, mm. I'm not gonna bring this up if it's gonna kick hazard pay because number one, it's gonna fail. It's going to look like I haven't been truthful to people that I've been explaining what I'm doing, or it's going to make me look like I don't know what I'm doing. So I ended up having to pull it from the agenda. And, and the whole reason why I was trying to put that at that time on the agenda is because we were trying to get ahead of the marginal way mm -hmm. encampment sweep. You know, and we talked about it in this show. We anticipated what's going to happen when marginal way gets swept. I asked Council of, uh, Council of Pelletier, what do you think is going to happen? Everyone's going to go to Harborview. And sure enough, it's played out exactly as I said. And, you know, the fact that my attempt to have a moratorium on sweeps got, you know, uh, in all essence, got killed by staff, um, you know, brought us on to have to deal with Order 68, which, you know, in a very similar way, got also killed by, by staff. Mm -hmm. You know, the staff memo of all one yeah. <laughs> I'm really heated up about this, you can tell. The staff memo that included all of the apartments and all the different yeah. you know, concerns that they had. You know what department was missing from that memo? Yeah. <laughs> Our equity office. Yeah. <laughs> uh. You know what we did a year ago on the, on the council? We stated that our goal is that all of the decisions are going to be viewed at through an equity lens. Hmm. How, odd, how odd is it that a staff memo does not include the equity director's perspective on what Order 68 is aiming to accomplish? Did they forget to ask the equity officer or the equity officer? I guess it's just, just not part of our normal proceeding. Yeah. yeah. They had, okay. we had a memo from every director except the racial equity director. The new racial equity director yeah. that we specifically hired to align with our goals and we budgeted for was not asked or didn't get to submit um, feedback mm -hmm. on the proposal. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's like, wow, well, you know, we made racial, racial equity our goal and conveniently have sidestepped it significantly with this. I mean, we received a lot of data from the ACLU on the racial impacts that sweeping encampments has. Mm -hmm. The data and the information is right in front of us and we're still like, no, let's not do it. So that's why even for our goal setting workshop on Monday, I'm like, I don't even know 
why are we doing racial equity? Let's not even do it if we're not actually going to align ourselves with it. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not going to do it seriously, we have a director, a racial equity director. We have a fir the city's first ever department of DEI. And he's not included in that conversation. He's not included. He doesn't get to write a memo. We don't have that information. So from the, from the beginning in terms of the movement of Order 68 and a lot of the things and the conversations that were happening, I think it was it was challenging. And I think the, the last thing I'll say about it, too, is that we received feedback as well that why would you put it on the agenda so late, like before the new counselors joined, as if that was the plan somehow. And it was like underhanded when really you wanted to get that on the agenda for like the October meeting. And because of the staff pushback, you weren't able to. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I, I think it goes to show that it can be extremely difficult to put things on the agenda if they are historically something that we've never done before as a city um, and pushes back against some of the structures that we have. Well, aren't the, isn't the city of Portland lucky to have you and Council Rodriguez there to remind the city that, hey, we have a new, you know, we have goals, we set goals, we, uh, we allocate budget resources mm -hmm. to goals. Why yeah. would you allocate budget resources yet not use the, anyway. Yeah. Um, we have another clip that is a, a little bit more about comprehensive services, maybe, that uh, unhoused people might need. The thing that I remember that stuck with me from uh, Mayor Dion's uh, first debate was that he looked straight at the camera and he was addressing Janet Mills and he said, Governor, you know, you're gonna, you need to step in here and do your job. So um, I, th I felt that this uh, gentleman that we're going to hear for him in a minute, um, some of his issues uh, probably are addressed mm -hmm. or could be addressed at the state level. Okay. More equal spending and funding for people that are struggling with homelessness would be one. Uh, uh, needs to be a, just a broader range of services available for those that are being slipping through the system. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, more advocation for the homeless in terms of mental illness, uh, uh, places to be held more accountable. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I agree, Lisa, that to what, what you were alluding to that a lot of what we need is support from from our state partners right from the governor's office from the legislature and and not to say that we've not had support from them but, but what we need right now is some just acute emergency crisis management support and and i i i want to i want to i do feel a little bit of the optimism in what uh, mayor Diane can potentially accomplish just giving the experience and the relationships that he has um in augusta and that that I, you know, it's, it's pretty fair to characterize him as someone that has been in this field for so many years that he's built so many relationships. And um, hopefully that does pay up uh, or that does kind of, you know, come out as, as helping us support uh, the needs of, of folks, um, you know, through, through state resources. That's an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Pelletier, do you have anything to say about mental health services for... Well, for any, I mean, to me, yeah. when I hear mental health services, I think, well, everyone needs mental health care, mm -hmm. and many people that are unhoused also need mental health care mm -hmm. and find it hard to stay in housing because of uh, living with mental Ill certain mental illnesses. But is that something that the city of Portland could possibly fund and provide without significant subsidies from either the state or the federal? Yeah, I think we would, I think the significance of, like, a di like extended and significant funding would probably be hard for the city of Portland to do on its own. And I also I also think it comes down to the priorities that we have. As we saw, like we had racial equity as a priority. I, I don't know how many times we've actually done anything in terms of really aligning with those goals. I will say that that's something that we can definitely talk about in health and human services and public safety. When we set our goals about like, what are we able to do? What do we have the power to do around mental health? I know last year we talked about safe injection sites, which I think would be significantly helpful here in Portland as we see with the encampments and people, a lot of the emails and the feedback we get are that people are seeing needles everywhere and that individuals are using in front of them. If we had a designated site where people could actually 
use in a safe manner, I think that that would be really helpful and hopefully alleviating some of that. So I think around providing resources to our unhoused community in a wide array of options, I'm hoping that in the committee, when we do set our goals, we can see what our options are. I know we'll also have a new Health and Human Services and Public Safety Director mm -hmm. as well. So that will be an interesting conversation around getting to know this new hire, this new individual, and making sure that we can really align the goals that we have in that committee with the, the overall goals of the council. And I mean, we're gonna have to do everything that we can possibly do in order to work together to provide for our unhoused communities. The encampments aren't going anywhere, um, regardless of the 161 Riverside Street shelter that we opened, regardless of the additional 50 beds, the encampments are not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think now it's, what are we able to do as counselors, as a community, to make sure that we are recognizing these individuals as part of our community and providing the resources that they so desperately need. Um, and it's gonna take all of us to, to support that. I think people wanna snap their fingers and the encampments are gone. Mm -hmm. That's not realistic, that's not gonna happen. And as we continue to grow and diversify as a city, um, we're gonna have to get used to things that happen in cities. And I think that there That's will wonderful. never be, we will never be free of encampments. Um, that is ever. the perfect segue to our final clip, which is about things that happen in cities, but it's not for uh, for once about actually unhoused people. I, I think that people will enjoy hearing this person, this Portlander's perspective. Yeah, I'm uh, concerned about the, you know, decline of the ha housing for year round residents and sort of the, like, the lack of low income housing particularly as like a working artist in Portland, that's um, pretty important to me and, and might, you know, force me out. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's always on the, on the back of my mind. Mm. So this person kind of personified that argument of like, you know, it's the creative people that make Portland such yeah. an attractive tourist yeah. location for people to come for the art, for the performance art, yeah. for the food. If you drive those people out and they can't afford to live here, what are you going to have left? Mm -hmm. That this artist articulated it really well. Yeah, and I think we're seeing. Yeah, no, absolutely. That. Oh yeah, go go ahead. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just going to say and, and add that as we've often had, you know, a, a lot of our hospitality workers are under the same, you know, circumstances. They're some of the lowest earning people, and they they make up a huge percentage of our workforce here in Portland. And they, most of them cannot even afford to, to live in, in, in the same town that they work in. And I, I've, I've said they can't even afford to work for the hours that they're, that they're working because the parking meters are so expensive. Hmm. Oh. Oh, I thought it got cut off. I was like, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say that this is... A, yeah, this is a this is a national problem. It's not unique to Portland, and I completely agree. The reason Portland is so great is because of the individuals that are the working class, hospitality individuals, the service industry workers, the backbone of Portland. Um, and I think that happens often where it's a really beautiful, quaint, working class city that then, as time goes on, starts to get overdeveloped and starts to cater towards individuals that are wealthier, individuals that are tourists. Um, you know, we just passed a tourism in this tourism industry district on a vote that that some of us weren't advocating for but it was I, I think for housing i'm hoping that in committee again we can look at the the airbnbs we can look at little things that we're able to do to actually uh, alleviate some of the unaffordability of portland but it's it's gonna it has been and will continue to be a significant problem because we have limited housing stock and a significant amount of demand so it's really just chipping away at, at an issue that has become bigger than us and is a, a thing that we're seeing at the national level. And those artists making the city look so attractive. I know. And so cool and, you know. Yeah. I know. It okay, happens in every city. Yep. Every city. Every city. Indeed. Yep. Can I follow up real quick with what Tori sure. just said? Um, I, I agree. I think that we have some really, uh, we have some great opportunities uh, of work that we can do in the committees. I think the short-term rentals is something that we have to pick up and figure out what we can uh, alter there to, to help our, our housing stock and our rental housing stock. I think that we need to get goals that have objective measurable outcomes. You know, when we create goals in, but perhaps not on Monday's goal setting for the council, but in our committee goal settings, um, you know, we, we should have a goal. I was talking to newly elected Councillor Sykes about this. We should have a goal of the number of units that we want to have accomplished, or at least in the pipeline by X date. Mm. Um, and, and the last thing I want to say is about our goal setting exercise on Monday. You know, I, I, over the last two years, I think we've set these really high time. overarching goals. I, I want to hold that thought. Goal that, 
We're out of time, literally. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. <laughs> Thanks for uh, zooming in. And uh, thank you, audience. Thank you, the tech crew here at Portland Media Center. Couldn't do it without you.